if you're competing for ad money, then your incentive is to churn out as many articles as you can with clickbait headlines that drive traffic from Google, and that's good for your ad revenue. But that sucks for the reader, you know? Yeah. Uh, so with the subscription model, it incentivizes you to put out high quality content that people will actually pay for. People won't pay for your clickbait stuff, you know? They, they'll, yeah. they'll want quality. And so I think that creates a healthy incentive structure. To Mission D5 with Brad Nickel, where we explore projects in decentralized finance that are innovating and driving our mission of financial freedom forward. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review Mission D5 and spread the word by posting a tweet to the show. All opinions expressed by Brad Nickel or his guests are their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Black Knox, Material Indicators, or any other affiliated organizations. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Brad Nickel or his guests as an inducement to make a particular investment, follow a particular strategy, or become involved with any project. A project being featured on the show is not an endorsement of that project in any way. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Now, here's Mission DeFi with Brad Nickel. All right, I am excited today to have Aiken Gainch from DL News. He's the managing editor there, and DL News is a new competitor in the crypto DeFi news landscape. And I'm I'm actually pretty excited because of the credentials of the folks on this team, actual real journalists. And I think we need a lot more of that in this space. People with credibility and journalistic integrity is something I think we might be missing. And so I'm excited to find out about the foundations of it and uh, how it came about and where they're headed. And so Aiken, thank you so much for joining me. If you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Brad. And that was a nice introduction, all the music to my ears. You know, that's also our mission, vision. So myself, I will give you a crypto background, crypto focus background. I've been interested in crypto for a long time because I was, I was involved in like political philosophy circles in Turkey, where I'm from in early 2010s and organized a Bitcoin conference in Istanbul in 2013 wow. with the founder of BTC Turk, who later became the founder of BTC Turk, which is the biggest crypto exchange in Turkey. I think by volume, he told, he told us to get into Bitcoin by Bitcoin. But, you know, we were more interested in the political implications of Bitcoin. And that nice. interest has continued over the years. In 2015, I was a research associate in a research group at the Future of the Mental Institute at Oxford. I wrote a paper on, I actually found this paper recently. That's why it's fresh in my memory. I wrote a paper on the political possibilities of Ethereum. And it's funny to me that I apparently thought, I, I somehow thought that prediction markets would be this big thing on Ethereum. And so... You know, that was my, or DAOs, prediction like DAOs running prediction markets and the risks, political risks from it. Yeah, so always a political, political interest in crypto. But then in 2020, a friend of mine who worked a crypto media outlet, he asked me to, he asked me if I, I was interested in, you know, writing on Bitcoin price movements. So the idea is like, Bitcoin goes up, Ethereum goes down. So it's like, you're supposed to write. It's easy writing. So I'm like, sure, why not do it? You know, <laughs> sure. I like, I got like, wait. And so that was, that was like a weekend gig. And he didn't have weekend writers. Like he didn't have enough of them at least. So, you know, I started writing price movement stories in 2020. I had some like background understanding of crypto. So that helps. But like, right. I had to learn a lot, you know, because I miss out the DeFi summer, you know, like I was watching it from distance like i didn't know what was going on but i knew it was something about like it was like with smart contracts and all that in all of which i had like economic interest until that point so yeah right. so since 2020 i've just stayed in the space as a crypto journalist i written for decrypt coindesk culture three fortune vice and now i'm managing editor at dl news 
which is trying to offer this new fresh perspective in crypto journalism, as you beautifully put it. That's awesome. It, it almost sounds like you were headed down a path of either academics or politics. Have you have you kind of <laughs> stood back to the look back at the circumstances of your life and thought, how the hell did I end up being a crypto journalist? I mean, I know you know how, but I mean, yes. just like, wow. No, it's more like, how did I not end up being where I am, like in crypto broadly, much earlier, given that, <laughs> you know, like, I was like shilling Bitcoin on a philosophical level, like political philosophical level to my friends in like 2012, 2013. So I'm like, I was already fascinated by it. You know, I, I downloaded, what's it called? GUI miner software in 2013. And my sole intention was to be able to buy coffee with the Bitcoin that I would mine, like in Berlin. That was the thing. Right. I'm like in America, you had like pizza shops. Right. And whereas in Europe, like in Berlin, especially, it was like mostly coffee shops and it was like this hippie alternative scene that was, that would like encourage crypto adoption. So yeah. So thinking back, I'm like, how did I like end up in the dark path of becoming either like a policy person? Cause I worked in Brussels, Washington, which I didn't mention cause it's irrelevant to crypto career. And then, you know, I, I, I yeah, I've also got like a long academic background. So now thinking back, I'm like, I, you know, I should have been in this space much earlier. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just find it interesting. Yeah. The paths people end up on it, it, And what's funny is the, the paths into this space, whether it's founders, journalists, editors, community members are all so often unexpected and varied, but I, I actually really like yeah. the fact that you're initial focus, because it's unique among folks I've interviewed, your initial focus was the political implications of Bitcoin. Often people come into this with a, a fervent, whether it's libertarian or liberal or conservative perspective on Bitcoin and that, you know, they find in it that they gravitate to it because of their existing political beliefs. But, but for you, it almost sounds like it was a, um, an academic approach, which actually obviously makes sense from the journalistic side of it, of saying, what are the overall implications of that? Do you, do you think, do you think from a political perspective, it still has the, the power that the potential of it was when you first got interested in it? Well, actually your suspicion is right. And that also applies to me. I was involved with classical liberal youth organizations in Turkey, you know, early in my undergrad years. And my academic interests, like in political process, they were all shaped by my, you know, personal interest in classical liberalism, libertarianism, Austrian school of economics. So when I heard about like Bitcoin and that was like, so at the time, I think the big debate in like classical liberal libertarian circles was around like gold standards. Like remember, right. this was like the gold, gold bull market right. at the time. So, and then Bitcoin came around and then you start having like debates so of could Bitcoin like be like this tool that separates money from the state and right. you know gain back that control that we lost in 1970s. Right. And of course, like people didn't didn't think Bitcoin is like the next gold. I think that narrative narrative came much later. At the time, it was like you know currency. We didn't have the store of value gold narrative at the time. So yeah, my interest was certainly political as well. And I found that fascinating because like money is like the last, I guess, space where we, you know, there wasn't much innovation. It's still pretty much under government's control and it's like having the impact on people's lives, you know, especially like I, I'm from Turkey where, you know, the inflation, I think is around like 120% or something now. I think officially it's 70%. The opposition claims wow. it's much higher. And it's, you know, arbitrary monetary policies. So yeah, that's that was the motivating factor behind my thinking too. So you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's interesting that 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 no matter where you are in the political spectrum, if you believe that the separation of money from state is important this is a fit, right? That's what I've always found so fascinating. I, I think some of the loudest voices are more on the libertarian side of things, but I find it fascinating the, that the, the, the entire political spectrum 
is represented in this space because people all see the dangers of money and state. And I, and I think that's, I think that's a really interesting thing about the whole space. And I think it has incredible potential and, and power, the potential for power to make change in the political arena. It'll just be interesting to see if we're able to take it further. So. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned gold standard debates, you know, around the time Bitcoin emerged, I think another debate was, or maybe it was like limited to more academic or like policy circles, the debate around private banks issuing money, which was a thing during the, I think Scottish enlightenment or perhaps before that, don't want to tweet me on that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, banks would issue private money and then in Scotland, right. This different, almost like monetary policies would compete with each other. So George Selgin, who's now a crypto critic at the Cato Institute, he ha he runs the alternative money department, I think it's called at the Cato Institute. He came to speak to us in Istanbul at the time, to join like 2010, I think 2011. So our ideas and our fascination with Bitcoin you know, was like shaped by this debate. So like Bitcoin seemed to represent like this next step. So yeah, I think in the beginning, as you said, a lot of people, you know, came to crypto or Bitcoin specifically, because that's still like something Bitcoin maximalists will tell you. It's like a completely separate thing, right? That's if Bitcoin right. is one thing, crypto is another thing. So yeah, they came with these ideals, but I think we've lost these ideals over time. Maybe they still live on among like more hardcore Bitcoin circles. But I think, you know, we can't deny that a lot of people now are drawn by the crazy numbers in crypto and not necessarily the political ideals, but perhaps they get like pills like over time. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? It's crazy. Well, real quickly, I do want to say you, you've mentioned that you're originally from Turkey and we discussed this before we started recording, but obviously our hearts go out to family and friends of yours there who are experiencing horrible devastation. And I'm yeah. going to put in the show notes links to some of the charities in the crypto community that are, are helping out or trying to help out. But, uh, you know, all of, all of us, our hearts out to your friends and family that are experiencing suffering right now. So thank uh, you. Actually, I hope I hope they're able to recover as quickly as possible, but it sounds like it's going to be a while before that happens. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But yeah. prior, you know, we often talk about the adoption of crypto in Turkey while we're on Turkey real quick. And I promise we're going to get to why you're here. But we often talk about the adoption levels of crypto in Turkey. Is it something in the in the average person's mindset? an understanding of, of in general terms, what crypto is and, and the importance of it based on the inflation rates there in, the, in that country. So there has always been a tradition of storing, like seeking alternative stores of value or not even alternative stores of value. Cause they, people in Turkey understand that you can't store your money or your, you know, net worth in Turkish Lira, which loses, depreciates massively every year. So like the base understanding exists already, like that understanding, I guess, become, has become like more clear in the West with like mm -hmm. this high inflation that we've had recently, but you know, people understood perfect in Turkey. So that makes right. crypto adoption easier. You know, once you have that right. um, understanding about, you know, inflation and its impact on your, you know, well, financial well-being and then financial well-being translates into you know, all sorts of well-being. So. Because of that, I think people understood, you know, crypto could offer something valuable to them. But it, this is where a lot of people, I think, get it wrong. They'll like, you'll see articles being written on Turkey and they'll talk about like how people are turning to Bitcoin to like flee from the inflation that surrounds Turkish lira. Whereas the reality is they'll like, they'll bet on Bitcoin perhaps, but much of the volume, I believe, is still in stable coins. Because USD ah. in US dollar has always been store of value in Turkey. I think Americans, especially the libertarians in America, like those who are critical of the, you know, the Fed's money printer, they don't quite appreciate the fact that in Turkey, Argentina too, I believe, USD is seen as a, you know, as a safe island. It's like it's uh, well, when you're living with 120%, yeah. I guess that's it's certainly exactly a much better. Yeah. yeah. And that's, the way people will better. look at it, yeah, the, the, the way people look at USD in Turkey 
I'm guessing, I'm guessing because I don't know what the same in Argentina, I suppose, is they'll they'll say USD has gone up by this much. And they're like, oh, USD has gone up by 20% this year. Like they don't see it as <clears throat> Turkish lira going down and USD perhaps going down by 2%, right? right? They'll see it as like this USD, this bullish asset. So that's, that's a super wide spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like super, super common mindset in Turkey. So and this is where like crypto comes into play. So USD, you had to go to an exchange bureau or like to a bank to buy it, or you could buy it on your bank app, right? Your bank. Right. But like, even if it's a bank app, it will be open only business hours, or it will uh -huh. have like higher fees after 5 p.m. Or there will be okay. limits. Even during like work hours, the exchange rate will not be as attractive as the exchange rate on Binance. So people mm. will put their yes. Turkish lira on Binance, they'll swap it to Tether and they'll, they'll, you know, when they need to spend it, they'll, you know, convert it back into Turkish lira, they'll spend it locally. I know a lot of, you know, friends in Turkey do that. They'll just like preserve their value, the value of their money in, you know, stable coins on Binance and yeah, that's how they'll spend it. And that's like that's fascinating. Quick, quicker, cheaper than the alternatives, which are banks, the apps of those banks, exchange bureaus. You know, I mean, young people don't go to exchange bureaus. It's most of the, you know, older generations. But so, yeah, that is really the story. That's of fascinating. Crypto in Turkey, yeah, stable coins. Yeah, and I think that I think the perspective is fasting, right? This perspective is different to, towards money in different ways based on what they have to live, right? So, all right, let's get into... DL News. So first, if you could give yeah. us an overview of what it is and how it came about. We know it's a part of the DeFi Llama family. We we talk about DeFi Llama probably two or three times a week because we use their tools on our daily lunch show quite a bit. And it feels like there must be about 700 developers on that team with the amount of stuff they crank <laughs> out every day. Yeah. So I think that puts Absolutely. a standard for you guys that could be <laughs> difficult to keep up with in, in the realm of journalism. But tell us about what DL News is, what your goal is, and then how this all came about, how you ended up being a managing editor of, of uh, the managing yeah. editor of this product, of this Venture. product. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So... Well, DL News came about the same way Llama came about, with the observation from the Llamas that, you know, uh, something better could exist in the space. So for DeFi Llama, that was, you know, data dashboards, on-chain data, beautifully presented, aggregated to everyone, you know, whoever wants to access that, up to date. And then DL News, same way, the founders saw that something was lacking in the space, you know, between mainstream media that's always too critical and also often they're bad at understanding the technical nuances that exist within crypto you know crypto tutor always complains about that and now you got crypto news outlets you know that try to do a good job but like the incentive structure is such that they're chasing news they do a lot of rewrites of each other and then sometimes you don't have time for original reporting and also they'll be made too shilly, or I don't want to say shilly, although you say shilly in a very loose sense in crypto, right? Right, uh, right. Be like too pro crypto and they'll kind of like brush off any negative points. And because they're so embedded in the industry, they may not feel comfortable like speaking out yeah. or like pointing out or like being very like rigorous with criticism and all that. There's no, there's not much investigative reporting in crypto. You know, any investigative reporting we have, like, tends to come from mainstream media. I think, uh, I want to say, I think made with Fox or The Verge, like one of those outlets, sorry, I can't remember that. They had like an amazing piece on Justin Sun. And I'm like, why haven't we covered this in crypto, like crypto outlets, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, this is our guy, like he's, he's like. How does it that they so make that media. kind of a report? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. So yeah, and the founders wants to offer something, offer a third space that like that is between you know mainstream respectability and like rigor, original reporting, investigation, and blend it with like more crypto native understanding that's you know reflects 
that reflects the nuances that exist in the space you know, more accurately than mainstream media would. So as a result, we don't accept ads. We don't accept sponsorships. Uh, nice. Yeah, at the moment, it's all free, but over time, we'll move into a more you know, subscription model. We'll be paywalled eventually, but you know, we'll still put out a lot of free material, free content. And defagama.com will, will always be free. Uh, so it's only the only is. Then that's, I think, a more viable business model than the ad and sponsorship model. Well, at yep. least I think it's worth trying. Sure. You know, it's new in the space, that kind of business model. So, well, it's, an, it's, aligned, amazing, it's an aligned incentive, right? For you, in order to drive a subscription model, you guys have to drive a team that's producing high quality material that people want to pay to read, yep. right? And it's got to be able exactly. to cut through all of the noise that's in this space. So I love that. I, I, I think I love that that's the, the approach you're, you're taking with this. Mm -hmm. I also love, um, you know, I, I tweeted a few months ago that I think people are going to turn around in a year or so and find that the DeFi Llama family is going to be a significant component of all of DeFi because of all of the pieces that the company is building. And that makes it really interesting for you all, right? The, the, the nice thing is, is most of what DeFi Llama is building doesn't, there's nothing that requires you to have any bias towards it because most of what they put to market is things that are either aggregating information or presenting data off chain off the chain right so uh, right, yeah. it doesn't put you guys in a quandary of ethics with with the DeFi llama protocols and often you guys will be able to use the tools within the the realm of your reporting so i love the fact that all of these entities are going to feed each other and i think it's i think it's i think it's brilliant frankly you know one of the other things i talk about quite a bit being in the media realm in this space is that i actually believe that there's an incredible opportunity for if we continue in the growth that we're seeing overall for DeFi and crypto, that there's an opportunity for a media organization that has transformed from traditional structures of media organization into one that has data and other things, but in and around crypto, there's a multi-billion dollar media opportunity. If we can permeate the rest of the world, like we all want it to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think from a business perspective, there's a huge amount of potential here for, for DL news. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, that sounds about right. So I'll say one thing about your, I think, on point comment about, you know, the incentive alignment, that's actually right. So if you are in, you know, if you're competing for ads money, then your incentive is to churn out as many articles as you can with clickbait headlines that drive traffic from Google, and that's good for your ad revenue, but that sucks for the reader, you know? Yeah. Uh, so with subscription model it incentivizes you to put out high quality content that people will actually pay for. People won't pay for your clickbait stuff, you know, they, they'll, yep. they want quality. And so I think that creates a healthy incentive structure. As for the business point, I think you're right. Uh, I had the same intuition, but bear in mind the way media works. I think a lot of people don't realize that the way media outlets work the business sides will be separate, like independent from the editorial side or sure. other way around. Editorial side will be separate from business side. Right. Uh, so like the business side of the L news, they don't get to see our drafts stories. They don't, you know, they don't know what we're talking about, what stories we have in the pipeline. And then, you know, that's same for anyone who is not in the editorial chat. Who doesn't have an editorial function reporters editors um and so that's a value that's like cherished in you know journalism editorial sure. integrity yeah uh, so we don't think about like what's going to make us money when we write about it i'm sure you know the business side wishes that we did uh, <laughs> but i think you on this like if you the internet the online communities the readers they reward good content like you know it's from your podcast business for sure if you produce, you know, quality content, the internet will reward you. That's what That's I believe right. in. So I was looking at our, uh, you know, reader, like reader numbers, especially time spent on each article. They're insanely high. I've nice. never seen anything like that. Any of the outlets I worked at, like I think others who joined from other outlets can also, well, they were actually saying that today that, you know, people are spending minutes on like the stories that we put out. It's usually like seconds. That's awesome. Um, so that's very encouraging to see. 
Yeah. Uh, so that shows us that we're on the good path. But that, you know, that's great. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. and I think look the the subscription model versus the ad model. You it, the it, it makes a difference in who you hire, right? If you're cranking out as many articles as possible for SEO purposes and, and clickbait purposes, then the people that you're hiring don't even understand this industry most of the time. And it's reflected in some of the big publications. I'm not gonna name names, but you, you see a lot of garbage, a lot of garbage. In terms of the subscription versus ad model, I, I think it results in obviously lesser quality content like you just discussed, but it also reflects the quality of people that are hired right and so on, on mm -hmm. your side you have the luxury if you all are successful in driving a subscription model eventually of hiring high quality and 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 that has been historically one of the biggest problems in the space is that the best journalists end up taking jobs at protocols or chains doing some yeah. kind of content contribution or they're just smart and understand it that they end up one of the best journalists that I valued in the space ended up, you know, being hired by I'm sorry. And I, and I can't blame him for doing that because, yeah. you know, I get it. He's a I, I he was, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, and so from my perspective, <laughs> I really, I really, I'm glad you guys are taking that approach and, and I'm glad we're not going to see it layered with ads because I think it's a smart approach in terms of, you know, what, you, from an editorial perspective, how are you approaching what the team writes about is is, is your team out finding story pitching them to you do you guys have a general direction of the kinds of things you want to cover is that something you can talk about sure yeah so i think every media outlet will be more or less the same reporters are encouraged to pitch news stories that they may have spotted so today we're covering kraken staking news for instance its impact on lido it will be out by the time this podcast is out. We discuss that in the morning, in morning's editorial meetings that we have, you know, every day at 9 a.m. for half an hour at least. We discuss the stories that we have in the pipeline and troubleshoot any, you know, issues that reporters may have. Uh, so that's one. And then editors will also suggest stories. And sometimes reporters themselves will suggest stories that they are not able to write for whatever reason, and uh, you know, but others may be available. So it's a very, you know, freestyle kind of, but like reporters are like highly encouraged to pitch stories. So that's like true for every news outlet. The best reporters will be those who, you know, pitch stories, report on it well, and then, you know, turn in a clean copy, understands the subject. That's like highly sought in the media uh, landscape. And that's true for free freelancers as well. We have freelancers who work with us and if anyone's watching this and you know they are they want they are in they're good at they're good with words and you know they can they think they can do journalism reach out to me you know maybe it works out and so yeah we also welcome freelancers they'll have pictures sometimes you'll assign stories so it goes both ways and then usually a lot of discussion around how do we cover this story what angle we take can we make if others have already covered it, can we do it better than them? You know, like we don't want to do a rewrite of whatever Reuters said. Right. Like a whole story cannot be about that. But, you know, we got the data aside. You know, we can use, we can leverage the Lama data to tell interesting stories. So we always got that advantage. And of course, like the Lama is open to anyone and it's wonderful seeing, you know, mainstream media also employing the Lama data, but I guess it just like comes more naturally to us. And that's like another angle we try to keep in mind, like can we leverage the Lama data? And sometimes you just let the data tell you a story. You know, really, I personally look at the dashboards you know, every morning to see if there's like some story in there, like, you know, <clears throat> some protocol losing a lot of money or high levels of inflows for like Binance, who knows? You just gotta keep an eye out, but you know, stories, they're not hard to come by in crypto. We have like more story ideas that we can cover <laughs> most bet. of the time. That's true for all news outlets. That like makes your job stories. a lot harder. Yeah, also a lot easier. I got like friends asking me how we're like doing like in the bear market, like with all the FTX crash. And I'm like, it's been a wonderful time for crypto journalists. Uh, <laughs> I don't for mainstream journalists. You yeah, it's have like so many stories. Yeah. 
Yeah, picking must it's... be difficult though. It's kind yeah. of it, yeah. It's kind of like all the all the journalists on the left side of the of the mainstream media spectrum who wanted Trump not to be president anymore, but it was the best time <laughs> of their lives as journalists, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, I and SDX is interesting in that I think that was like the only story that the mainstream media, not the public, the you know, the general public truly followed. I don't think like anything comes close to it. Like, well, yeah. like nothing. I think in crypto history right. was this big. So yeah, it's been an interesting few months because of that. You know, FTX blew up just around when it started as well. So you know, right? That's that right. also of course. Like, yeah, covered that kind of coverage. A bunch of FTX stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys have done some stories on on three AC, Doquan. You know, you've really kind of you kind of came out of the gate running pretty hard. Our Doquan was your first, the first major story on the site, if I'm not mistaken. I think we had other stories before that. I think okay. Our launch story, our launch story was Andre Cronier. It was a profile, ah, and then we yeah. had a scoop. We had a scoop on SDX. Basically, the story was SDX sent ten million dollars to Alameda after bankruptcy, and we had right. files. We had documents from an insider. Nice. You're right. The uh, so that was the soft launch, right? And then the hard launch, the first story was Do Kwon for the hard launch that we had like two weeks ago. He's coming back or he's trying to come back. He's interviewing candidates for his new projects. And there are people who are excited about it. We had a source from ThreadFi who told us he's the most brilliant person in DeFi. And, you know, I'm like, wow. So <laughs> but I, I was, you know, I was also very glad to see Terra community felt that the story was fair and that's good. Uh, they, they didn't think it was like a hit piece or anything because like we made sure we interviewed like the Terra side. We made sure we interviewed like a former Terra employee as well. Journalism. So, you know, yeah, it balanced <laughs> how journalism should be. Um, exactly. So, what's it been yeah. like? What's, what's it been like hiring? Journalist, was, was that a difficult process? Was it was it tough to find people, or did you find that the the quality journalists were like, "Oh my God, I'm so glad you guys are here." It's a tough market. Everybody in crypto media will tell you that it's a tough market. You don't have a lot of like serious crypto journalists. You have a lot of yeah. content creators, and they're doing an amazing job in what they do, which is content creation. Journalism is a different beast. So we are also open to hiring journalists with no crypto background with the understanding that they learn crypto on the job and mm. so we offer what we call llama uni it's huh. a series of yeah it's a we we may make it we may partially make it public as well i think so it gives you all you need to get started you know in your crypto coverage so that's one thing and second thing we'll have crypto native editors so like me to look at copy, as, you know, in, right. in addition right. to your copy good. editing so that, yeah, so that our copy is like error free. So, and, I, in, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, mainstream journalists, you know, journalists who have like long track records in, you know, chasing interesting stories in other business sectors, they're able to translate that skill into crypto easily. Because when you take a step back and look at crypto, it's a financial asset. It's it's just finance with more memes and with more you know community feeling and like more drama and like colorful characters and more convoluted technology. All right, at this point it starts feeling a little bit different, but like the base level is yeah. you know it's just another industry and you just need to understand the learn it unique aspects of it, learn it, and you know people are learning fast. So yeah, we encourage mainstream journals to apply and that's cool i i yeah. i've been training a journalist at a, at a major mainstream publication who calls me for quotes occasionally and i find that helping getting them to understanding functionally what we're doing is one thing getting them to kind of understand the nuance of the concepts and some of the belief systems in the space is a little more difficult yeah, for yeah. some of them to grasp because it's initially, initially so foreign 
to what, you know, and this person had been a finance reporter, you know, a TradFi reporter, but I do find, I have found that that person has rapidly spun up their knowledge level. And, and I think it's interesting because I think journalism is one of those careers, you know, in my entire career, I've been kind of a seat of the pants, learn by doing kind of guy. The, the beauty of journalism is you have to learn by doing right. You, you don't, That's you don't right. have a choice right. when you're on deadline and you have to write a story about something. You've got to figure it out as you're going. And I often find it interesting when people in an industry complain about reporters screwing up a story or not understanding something that they're writing about, you know, look, if you're being in what I tell founders is if you're being interviewed by journalists and you're not sure that journalist understands what you're talking about, then it's your job to make sure that that journalist knows what you're talking about, because otherwise the, the output is not going to be what you were hoping from, from that perspective. So. That's right. And you know, if a journalist fucks up, then the editor will have to issue a correction. You know, right. all journalists have had that experience. I had that experience. That's like the nature of the game. So, and you know, and then your error is for the whole world to see. And it's always, it's, it's there on the internet forever. You know, if you're a doctor and you fuck up, then your patient may die. If you're a lawyer and you fuck up, your, you know, client may go to jail. But if you're a journalist, you fuck up, then it's announced to the whole world. And like, you know, it's, it's forever there. So people who are upset with bad reporting, they should just reach out to the editors or the journalists themselves and like express their frustration, like what they think is, 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 is wrong. And I think majority of time they'll, you know, they'll receive fair treatment. And if the editor finds, you know, the reporting was indeed sloppy, they'll make necessary corrections. And especially if there are people involved in report, like if there, say there's a news article on DeFi, about a DeFi protocol, and then people at that protocol don't feel like they've been given fair treatment. They didn't have their say. In that case, you know, almost certainly they'll have like a response paragraph in like after the story publication and it will come with like an additional update. I feel like a lot of people don't realize, you know, these things are still open yeah. to change as long as you're not to change. So we have an ombudsman at DL News, a oh. journalist. Yeah. And he's there to deal with complaints and to, you know, launch like internal, I don't want to say investigation because it's not like more serious than reviews. Internal, like, well, it is internal reviews. That's right. So, you know, that's how, that's how, it should be done and because of that like it, when we interview someone we have to keep record recordings of those interviews because you never know you may have to review them and then make right. changes so yeah that's interesting you know frankly i kind of had in my head this whole startup atmosphere the fact that you guys already have an ombudsman on 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 the team is is pretty amazing to me because i just pictured you guys are still putting all together you know what do they say installing the wing while the what, replacing the wing while the airplane's in flight. It's very interesting to me that some of the more traditional aspects <laughs> of, of media organizations are already in place at, at DL News. That's fascinating. That's right. I mean, we are doing both, you know, uh, <laughs> we are doing both. It's very start to be at the same time. Sure. You know, it is what it is. It's a media startup. So we're learning by doing so. That's awesome. But we also have those structures. Yeah. In terms of the, the media you're producing, are you all expecting that, you know, the, the DL News will be divided into projects? You guys are going to be doing video and audio and written content at, at, at scale at some point? Kind of, do you guys have a vision for what you see one year, five years from now for, for DL News? Not that it's going to stay that way, but, you know. At the moment, we're, the only vision is to produce high quality journalism and that's in the recent format. Uh, we are certainly open to, you know, it's called photojournalism. So it can be blended with like regular journalism that we are open to. Video, we never considered that. Other for other forms of media, not on our agenda at the moment. But I can see that becoming a thing in the future. Who knows? But you know, not not in the pipeline. Just I think focusing on doing one thing really well. I think is what really matters at the moment rather than trying to do several things and not really delivering on them at a high quality that's needed. That's great. Well, look, I think it makes sense, right? Establish the brand, establish the reputation, make people take you seriously because of what you're producing based on what you've done. And, and I think that so that's a good path to success for you to decide whether you, how much more you want to expand beyond that. That's great.
Awesome. Is there, you, you're, you said you are hiring now journalists, freelancers, et cetera, for the team? Yeah, we are looking for full-time journalists. We are also looking for freelancers. You know, we're always open to more candidates. That's, I think, I foresee it being like an ongoing thing, the recruitment campaign. So for sure, we're, we're in an expansion mode, but we've just started. Nice. Realize how many, we can always, how many people yeah. on the team now? I think we just passed 30, but bear in wow. mind, a lot of people are on the business side. They're on the product sure. side, you know, they're building things from scratch and they had to deal with my complaints about the file my charts not being properly is <laughs> or like, oh, why don't we have the TVL chart in the native token? It's only USD token and then RSS feeds. It, RS feeds are coming. I think you gave it that feedback, didn't you? Yeah. I, yes, I did. They're working on it. They're working on it. Good. Uh, great. Because I need it for yeah. my daily show. Yeah. A couple of people have asked me about that. So, yeah. So, most people are on the business side at the moment. I think the editorial team, we're maybe around 10, something like that. Still pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's with like all the editors and reporters. So, yeah. But, you know, cool. Hoping to. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So I ask two questions at the end of, of, of every interview. One is very founder oriented, but I'll ask you anyway, just curious what, what you come up with. Sure. And the second one is, is something you can speak to. I, I promise. I ask a lot of, I ask founders over the time that, that you have been building what you're building in, in, in this case, a media publication, have you already learned some lessons that you would pass on to other folks, either in the media world or in building something like this and in this very short time frame that you guys have been live that you would pass on to other people or, or lessons you've learned in the past that you think would be valuable for people building something? So I think it would be fair to say that these things take a lot of time. It's not like shipping updates on defilemo.com. There are a lot of aspects you need to take into account when you're writing a story and we're all like learning it the hard way because we're doing, we're trying to do original investigative stories and you know, it's not a terribly common experience in crypto as we discussed. So now we need to speak with lawyers. Now we speak, we need to speak mm -hmm. with, we need to think about like journalism ethics. We speak with our ombudsman to get things right. So that delays the process. So, you know, maybe like a lot of people don't realize that when they set up a media company, if they want to do like serious journalism, I suppose that's one thing. That's one big thing that these things take time. And there are a lot of moving parts because remember, if you take out like one quote, if you change one thing, it can influence a lot of parts of the story. And then, you know, you need to rework it. So yeah, right. Like the harmony story, I hope like the listeners will go to our website and check out the harmony story that Tim Craig recovered in incredible detail, speaking with, I think, 10 to 15 Harmony people and every detail wow. cross-checked. It's yeah. Yeah. And we had like rounds of edits. We had like several editors on it. We had to make sure that, you know, legally, ethically, it was sound and everybody had their like fair chance to respond. So people who are accused in the piece, for instance, they receive like 1000 words email or something like that from Tim literally like listing, Hey, it's, it's alleged that this it's alleged that this, so I said this, do you want to like respond to them? And you can literally like respond to them one by one. And then you'll be, you know, given your space in the piece. They chose not to, no, like, which, I, which I respect, or like they just denied, you know, denied as well, whatever, yeah. but yeah, you need to give them time. Then you need to you know, deal with that. So these things take time, right? That's a great lesson that, that often we all think that things are going to move much faster than they would, I think, in any startup industry. And it makes sense to realize that you're, you're, you're thinking that something's going to happen in X amount of time is probably going to end up in Z amount of time. So Yeah, yeah. Classic. That's fair. Uh, you know, planning, planning fallacy. Yes. Um, and what's the second question? Can you remind me? So the second Maybe question is... Have... Who is yep. someone who is someone within the crypto space for whom you have a sig significant amount of respect or you think that is really critical, has been or will be really critical to kind of moving us forward in the crypto world? And oh, it doesn't so have to I be media. Yeah. Right, all right. 
So I on crypto Twitter, I I'm personally a huge fan of Hustle. Uh, I think nice. you know, even his like blog posts from years ago. I think they are still super insightful. I personally love Dijan Spartan. It's more of a shit posting nice. Twitter account, but I think he blends it with high quality, like mindset setting alpha. And that's a strange way of nice. putting it. You, you, if you follow the Jens Spartan, you'll, you'll know what I mean. And there are a lot of people I really look up to in crypto who are like builders, traders. I mean, in terms of traders, I'll mention crypto cred, who is uh-huh. such a wonderful person. I, I interviewed him in the past and he's like, He's a very wholesome person. Like he and he's got his, you know, trading tutorial on YouTube. Tries to teach technical analysis, which I know is controversial. You know, some people think it's bullshit trading analysis, but technical analysis. Sorry, but you know, he's doing something. He's trying to do something good for the space by educating yep. people. So uh, these qualities I highly, you know, look up to. Those are all excellent choices. I think re- represented yeah. positive forces in the space. So I love that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Aiken, thank you so much for your time. I'm I'm really excited to have you all in the world of crypto. I I feel like we had a big gap, and uh, I, I'm so happy to have a source that I look to for my own knowledge and for my show to be able to to have and know that they're real journalists with real ethics and integrity and editors like you making sure it stays that way in the space. I think it will make you all a force to be reckoned with in the in media world for crypto. So excited to see how things go for you, but thank you so much. Yeah, for likewise. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, thanks, man. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.